My name's uh, Tom Gash and I'm the Director of Research at the Institute for Government. Uh, I'll be your chair for today. Thank you very much for joining us for what I hope will be a very lively discussion. Indeed, looking around the audience, I know it will be a very lively discussion. It's just a question of whether we can avoid any actual fist fighting. So, um, what we're going to do today is two things. First, we'll look back at the history of some government improvement agencies. Firstly, we'll focus on those that Nick Timmons and I looked at in the Institute for Government study. We really majored on the Audit Commission there and the story of its, uh, its uh, life and then particularly its uh, slow death, gradual, not yet achieved. Um, and then the National Policing Improvement Agency and then one of the uh, organisations abolished by the previous Labour government, the uh, NHS Modernisation Agency. Of course we'll go much wider too, uh, particularly due to the experience of those of others in the room but also on our panel. We're lucky enough to be joined by Anna Walker but unfortunately we've been hit by uh, pneumonia that's taken out uh, Andy McKeon unfortunately but he is getting better now so don't worry about that too much. Um, and uh, Margaret Hodge who's got a vote but she will try and join us if she can. We may also be joined by uh, Norman Warner, Lord Warner who has a lot of experience of improvement agencies from the health sector. Again we've been hit by votes so he will be here as soon as possible as well. As well as looking back at past bodies and current ones that are under the media spotlight at the moment, including the Environment Agency and Ofsted, we'll be looking forward. I think hopefully having better understood why it is that these improvement agencies so often are born with much hope and optimism and then see their fortunes wane, we will hopefully try and have a debate about what the future is for improvement agencies in government and understand a bit more about how we could set them up to succeed, um, make sure that they achieve as much as possible while they exist and that they die gracefully. Um, it seems that we need to get better at births, deaths and marriages, certainly. So with 2015 looming, this be debate becomes more relevant than ever. The natural nature of the policy cycle is that uh, around the manifesto time we see lots of new policies. Many will involve improvement agencies in one way or another, getting rid of them or perhaps dare I say it, it happened in 2010 despite the cars creating a few as well. So before I introduce the panel, some housekeeping. First of all, the event is on the record. It's being recorded at the back there. Um, I expect a very full and frank discussion nonetheless. Um, do feel free to join the Twitter debate. Uh, we've got the details there of the wireless network that you need to join. The username is IFG, the password is visitor, and you can follow at IFG events uh, on Twitter, and the hashtag is Quangos. Um, the extra uh, format thing is about the format. So Nick Timmons is going to introduce some of the key findings of the research first. Nick Timmons is a senior fellow here, and as many of you know, was formerly the public policy editor at the Financial Times. Then Anna Walker will share her own experience of many different government improvement agencies and from many different angles. Uh, Anna is currently the chair of the Office of Rail Regulation, having formerly been chief executive of the Healthcare Commission, um, which was itself actually absorbed into the Care Quality Commission. Um, it's, she's also been a director general in DEFRA, which has plenty of experience with different types of improvement agencies and arms length bodies, and in the DTI, again, plenty of experience to draw on there, and was the Director General at Oftel. Margaret Hodge will then join us, and she'll be speaking, I think, particularly about uh, the impact of the abolition of the Audit Commission on scrutiny, public scrutiny and parliamentary scrutiny in particular, but she'll no doubt draw on her wider experience too when she manages to join us. And if Lord Warner gets here, we'll, uh, we'll hear from his experience of working across the health sector and in other areas. Um, he's also been the chair of the Youth Justice Board, so he's seen this from both the government side and from the side of an improvement agency or, in this case, a, an arm's length body. So after those short contributions at the beginning, this is going to very much open to questions and comments from the floor. Hopefully many of you will have a chance to contribute and chip in. And if you're in the room next door watching this on the screen, don't worry, you will have a chance to contribute to that Q&A section. So just pop your head through the door and someone will come and give you a microphone. We'll run until 7.30pm when I hope that many of you will stay for drinks and further discussion. For now, I will hand over to Nick. Hi, well, great to see you all here. Um, I have a confession. Uh, this is not Never Again, the last piece of work that I did for the IFG on Andrew Lanz's mighty set of NHS reforms. <coughs> Nothing, alas, so exciting. No attempt by Unison to flog off the NHS, or indeed the Audit Commission, on eBay. 
No blue light police escorts to get ministers to meetings. Or if there were in the case of the Audit Commission, I failed to find out about them. No one giving Eric Pickles the sort of brutal treatment that Andrew Lanza received from Sean Donnelly, the rapper known as MC Next Gen, who managed to rhyme PCTs with GPs, giving primary care trusts a level of street cred they never otherwise enjoyed. There's no such excitement. But then audit is audit. It doesn't set the world on fire, but only very, very occasionally, such as the Westminster Homes for Votes scandal several decades ago. But dull does not mean dreary or unimportant. After all, audit protects the public purse, which is your and my pound, given that everyone here pays tax, even if only in the form of VAT. Audit can provide standardised data, against which comparative performance can be judged. And there's more than a century of history which says that the appointment of auditors to public bodies should be as independent as possible, and increasingly over the years that there should be an independent body to stand behind those auditors. And all of that still feels at risk in the new arrangements that are intended, eventually, to replace the Commission, which itself will disappear pretty much a year to the day from now. Like a lot of people, uh, I was on holiday on Friday, August the 13th of 2010, a long bad Friday for the Audit Commission when its abolition was announced. Few other reporters on the Financial Times, which I then worked, had extensive dealings with the Commission. And the paper wrote one of those leaders that, for those of you old enough to remember his Radio 4 series, came out of the John Ebden School of Analysis. It came, as he used to put it, to no very particular conclusion, except to suggest that abolition might not be an entirely bad idea. And I suspect if I'd been there, it might have said something slightly different. The decision to scrap the Commission seemed to come out of the blue, announced when Parliament was in recess in the middle of August, and ahead of the conclusions of a much wider review of Quango's, which duly led to one of the ritual bonfires to such bodies in the following October. The decision kind of landed like a bombshell, yet it proved to be almost a silent explosion. Almost no one leapt to the Commission's defence, despite it having a long and honourable track record in improving public services, most notably those run by local authorities. And even its fiercest critics, and I could quote Eric Pickles here, acknowledged that it had played a significant part in the improvement of local government over the previous 25 years. An improvement that has arguably seen councils handle the swinging effects of the current austerity rather better than some central government departments. So dying to improve seeks to trace the history of the Commission's demise and ask why was the explosion so silent. Some people did, of course, indeed defend its work. And when I say almost no one led to its defence, those, those who did get offended. But many fewer did than might have been expected. There was no great public row. Although the difficulty of the issues that abolition raised is illustrated by the fact that it was originally promised that the new dispensation, councils appointing their own auditors, would be up and running in the, by the summer of 2012. It would, in fact, be 2017 at the earliest, and possibly 2020, before that happens, a mere five to eight years late, even though the Commission itself will be gone almost exactly a year from now. And this study attempts, not entirely satisfactorily, to explain all that. It contains very little in the way of revelation, although it does establish that one particular row that did the Commission absolutely no favours, the amount of money it wanted to pay an incoming chief executive, at a time when senior politicians in all parties were trying to curb the pay of public sector chief executives, or as the Taxpayers' Alliance so winningly put it, the fat cats of the public sector, had much deeper roots than were known at the time. John Denham, the community secretary in the Labour government, had been telling the Commission that it should not pay the £200,000 package that the Commission believed to be necessary. And he had done everything short of direction in saying that should not be the case, long before Eric Pickles has gone involved in a very public row about the issue. So there was clearly a degree of frustration with the Audit Commission on kind of all sides of the political divide, and not just over the pay row, with John Denham also feeling, and later saying in public, that some changes were needed. The Commission's work throughout its life was built upon the bedrock of audit, and on that much else was constructed. Value for money and national studies, which had varying impacts, some of them highly significant. And its role had changed markedly under Labour, some would say crucially and critically, from being merely a body that held up a very public mirror to the performance of local government, to that of an inspector, and at times an overweening inspector, even if it was ministers, not the commission, who defined the scope of that. 
Now, there's plenty of room for debate about whether the Commission studies were as good as they once were, and whether the comprehensive area assessment, uh, the geeks in the room among whom I count myself will know what that was, whether the CAA was a bridge too far, whether the Commission should or should not have retained 70% of the audit work itself rather than contracting it out, and whether it was itself no longer sufficiently sensitive to a change climate around public sector pay and value for money, evidenced by the row over the chief executive's pay. But all of that could have been dealt with without abolition. The commission, the commission could have been cut down to size, and reduced to its core audit function, and with big savings made, without it having to be scrapped. And of course, indeed, that's precisely what has happened over the past four or so years. Lord Hesseltine, the Commission's founder, was asked in evidence to a parliamentary committee what should be done if a body like the Audit Commission was perceived to have got out of hand. Change the chairman, he said. It is no more complicated than that. And it does seem to me that at least two important <coughs> things are disappearing with the death of the Audit Commission. And the first is independence of audit. Sure, there will indeed be complicated arrangements to distance council leaders themselves from the appointment of auditors, so councillors won't literally be appointing their own auditors, which was, after all, a declared aim of the abolition. Oversight of them will be fragmented between the National Audit Office and the Financial Reporting Council. But what there won't be is genuinely independent auditors of local authorities in the sense that the auditors will be appointed by an independent body that, in effect, randomly allocates auditors to councils and then stands behind them if the council and the auditor get into an unresolvable dispute about the use of public money and the auditor wants to issue a report to the public, a so-called public interest report, detailing that. Now, of course, auditors subscribe to all sorts of codes of practice to which they genuinely seek to adhere. And I'm not accusing them of dishonesty, but surely an auditor will be more reluctant to stand his or her ground when doing so may not only risk loss of that particular contract, but gaining at the same time the reputation for being an awkward auditor, which may affect future contracts. The coalition government has argued there have been very few cases where the Commission has had to indemnify an auditor in dispute with a council. That, it has argued, is evidence that the protection is not really needed. Rather, it seems to me to be the opposite case, that there have been very few cases precisely because councils know that if they take on the auditor, they're also taking on the Commission, which has the resources to stand behind the auditor. Audit and its consequences do need to be independent. And because of the need for that guarantee, in an entirely perfect world, we probably wouldn't let private companies appoint their own auditors. I mean, think Enron, Lehman Brothers, Royal Bank of Scotland. That would require such a mighty bureaucracy as to be unthinkable. But in the public sector, it's not only thinkable, but doable. And the Audit Commission did it. So independence of audit is the first issue. And the second is over standardisation of data, which the Commission could require. Standardised data and the understanding of what it actually means is critical to performance comparison. I've spent enough of my time looking at performance data across the public sector to know two things. One, the data itself has to be comparable, and two, you have to know enough about the business to which it applies to be able to interpret it. Data on its own can be deceitful. It requires intelligent, well-informed interpretation. Just look at the troubles we have hit in the health sector with the crude use of standardised hospital mortality data, which might tell you to ask questions, although even that is now in dispute, but which in itself certainly does not give you an answer. The Commission could not only require standardised data, but had the skills to understand it. Armchair auditors cannot command the former, standardisation, even if they have the skills to do the latter. And while some do, some many don't. And I would underline again that saying all this is not to undervalue the role that the local government association plays, nor the steps that it has itself taken uh, to help councillors compare and contrast their own performance. But at the end of the day, the LGA is a member's club. It cannot compel the recalcitrant to cooperate, and the Commission could. And finally, it just seems perverse that a year from now the Audit Commission will finally be abolished but an interim body is going to have to be created to limp on, overseeing the existing audit contracts until at least 2017, and quite possibly until 2020. And that just seems nuts. Uh, although the silver lining is that it's just possible that from the ashes of the Commission and its interim replacement, a successor could yet arise, Phoenix-like, to continue the Commission's core functions. 
The Audit Commission at the time of abolition cost some £200 million a year to run. The figure that follows is far from directly comparable, but it currently costs just £7 million annually. And that seems to me a small price to pay to ensure genuinely robust, independently backed audit of what is still over, well over £100 billion of public money. It costs well under 0.007% of total expenditure, a small price to pay for assurance. This report, however, is not just about the Audit Commission. Its fate and its switch from being a mirror to council performance to an inspector set us thinking about improvement agencies more generally. Because at its heart, that is what the Commission was, an arm's length body created to improve public services. That thought and the desire of the National Policing Improvement Agency to examine its own short history led us to look at the MPIA and a deliberately chosen as a very different example at the, modernization, the NHS Modernisation Agency in order to ask some broader questions about the fate of these bodies. Sure, some of them are very long-lived, but they have a distinct tendency to come and go, the health and social care sector being the most extreme example. Inspection in these areas went through three or four incarnations, depending on how you want to count them, in well under a decade. A litany of bodies, from the Commission for Healthcare Improvement, to the Healthcare Commission, to the National Care Standards Commission, to the Commission for Social Care Inspection, were repeatedly ripped up by the roots to see how they were doing, and replaced rather than reformed. The most recent incarnation, which brought all health and social care inspection together, the Care Quality Commission, had such a troubled birth that it's still recovering from its own history. What emerges from all this is the difficulty of being clear over what these bodies are about. There are distinctions here uh, between standard setting, inspection, regulation, and various forms of improvement, whether simply using the first three to try to drive improvement, or whether to get down and dirty and directly seek to provide improvement support. And there are distinctions here between the public and the private sectors that are real. As part of this, I reread the Hampton Report on regulation, though some months ago, so I won't recall every detail. Uh, and Hampton's good on private sector regulation, but it's weaker on public. There are tools you can use in the private sector that work less well in the public. For example, an inspector or regulator can make a judgment to work with a private company to tell them they have to tackle their issues or face public exposure with the threat of exposure damaging share price or owner's interests, and with fines or even potentially prison sentences to follow if they do not comply. But improvement agencies which seek to work quietly with public sector bodies risk charges of cover-up if things do not rapidly improve and then become public. The Morecambe Bay NHS Trust case that's rumbling on at the moment is a good case. Fines, certainly large fines, are of limited use in the public sector. All they really do is penalise future patients or pupils, not shareholders or company owners. And there is the conundrum that public sector regulators and inspectors are answerable to a minister who may well not want to hear fierce criticism of the public bodies within their remit because it's the minister who will have to answer in Parliament for what has gone wrong. So the minister is both the sponsor of the improvement agency and of the service. And this leads to tensions. Witness Michael Gove and Free Schools and Ofsted's current travails. Or the suggestion from some politicians that the floods were all the Environment Agency's fault, and if only it were abolished, it would somehow stop raining. <laughs> a, bit, a bit like that magic moment back in 1976, during that summer's mighty drought, when the government finally appointed Dennis Howell as Minister for Drought, only for it to pour with rain onto bone-hard ground a few days later, so that he effectively became Minister for Floods. <laughs> It's chiefly the broader issues of how we try to be clear about what improvement agencies do and how best to reshape them that I'd like to focus on this evening, rather than simply on the demise of the Audit Commission. Each of the three more detailed cases we examine is somewhat sui generis, and the broader issues of improvement agencies are not simple, so one should be wary of seeking to draw over-broad lessons from all this. But there clearly are some. Ministers and the agencies need to be as clear as they can be and total clarity may not always be possible, about how far they are, standard setters, inspectors, regulators, or direct improvers, and avoid muddling from one to another unless the reasons for doing so are clear. There's a need to avoid mission creep more generally. The NPIA and the Modernisation Agency, two very different types of body, became highly subject to that. 
the MPIA becoming known as the Christmas tree quango because so much got hung off it, while the Modernisation Agency became a receptacle for Minister's latest improvement whim and got pushed into performance management rather than just being someone friendly who was out there to help you. And there is a question, still live, in health and, still live in the health and social care sector, about whether inspection should only be about minimum standards, or whether it be used as a push for improvement, a kind of ratchet to push up performance more generally. Ministers and civil servants turn over. So the agency has a duty, one that it probably should not have, to endlessly explain to its department what it's there for. DCLG will doubtless deny it, but I was struck in the interviews for this piece about how many people at the Audit Commission felt the department no longer properly understood public sector audit. And the huge amount of time it's taking to actually abolish the Commission and to create a new regime, and the messy end to which the Commission is coming, seems to bear witness to that. It is worth thinking hard before abolishing these bodies. They, or some of the roles they play, may indeed have either outlived their usefulness or no longer be wanted. But using your gumption to reshape them rather than automatically reaching for the gunpowder will certainly, on occasion, make more sense. I'd argue the Audit Commission is a classic example of that. Abolishing these bodies does involve real opportunity costs, witness what's happened in the health and social care sector. And I put it to you that the most powerful bit of this little report is the appendix. It lists over two and a half whole pages where the main functions, just the main functions, the National Policing Improvement Agency have gone since it was abolished. In other words, even when we scrap them, a lot of the things these bodies do turn out still to be needed and have to be found new homes, just like audit. Thank you. So, welcome, Norman. Um, thank you very much for joining us at the last minute as a, as a stand-in. Um, I'm not going to call on you straight away, so you have a little bit of time to gather your thoughts and your breath after running over from the house, um, at the upper, upper house, presumably. Um, so I will hand over now to Anna Walker. And, and I've asked Anna to, uh, to think about an uh, even harder question than the one that Nick's been pondering, really, but thinking about how you can set up improvement agencies and public bodies so that they are more likely to succeed and to drive genuine improvement in public services. Well, thank you very much. Thank you for asking me to talk about this. I found uh, uh, the report actually an extremely interesting one, and by and large, uh, I agree with its conclusions, which makes it particularly easy for me to talk about it. Um, as Tom said in the introduction, I, I feel able to talk because I have quite a lot of experience in regulation, telecommunications, energy and water. I've also done uh, uh, a lot of these issues from within a government department. So I've seen things from ministers and a government angle as well. Uh, I currently chair the Office of Rail Regulation where we are responsible for both economic and safety regulation and trying to make a coherent whole out of that. And I was chief executive of the Healthcare Commission, the forerunner of the Care Quality Commission for the five years of its life. Um, I also sit on the other side uh, because I am on the board of a water company and I chair a charity for some severely uh, disabled young people with a school, a college and a health centre. And so uh, I face off what as a regulator and actually are serially inspected by the Care Quality Commission and Ofsted. So I feel I have some experience from that point of view. On Nick's spectrum of standard setting regulation, inspection and improvement, my experience is mainly in the regulation and inspection side. So I come at that rather than from a pure improvement agency. But by the time I finish, I want to say something about standard setting and something about improvement as well, which I feel very strongly about. So what uh, Tom uh, 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 asked me to talk about was how organisations can be set up to succeed, organisations of this sort, and how they can maintain focus, uh, legitimacy and support. And here are just a few thoughts on that. Um, and these actually really do echo many of the conclusions in the report that you've got in front of you. First of all, setting up to succeed, this question about uh, the relationship with government is quite clearly an important one. 
And there I would underline, <coughs> uh, I should actually say, I shall be very interested in Norman's views because Norman was the Minister for Health when I was the Chief Executive at the uh, Healthcare Commission, so he can talk about these things from his angle. Well, I'm <laughs> <laughs> I think it's really important to have joint clarity and understanding of purpose. And that is actually more difficult than uh, 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 it can seem to be. I think that it is very important to have a clarity of governance arrangements. And by that I mean two things. Many of the organisations that I've been involved with, including the Healthcare Commission, actually their value to government and the public is their independence. But how that's going to be achieved, actually, is really a very important issue. And my own view is that, uh, and I'm talking here as a regulator, that a regulator can be independent, and actually, by and large, my own experience is of government and ministers respecting that. But regulators have to understand that they're operating within the envelope of a democratically elected government and therefore actually understanding what the government's priorities are and without compromising independence, being willing to work with that seems to me to be extremely important. I think that the dialogue with government needs to continue over a period of time. And I have to say the Department of Health wasn't, not ministers, but civil servants, weren't always easy. And I, I have always found that if I've asked for a meeting with a minister, I've got it. Not always easy to keep the dialogue going. Actually, I found that both at the Department of Health and the Department of Transport with civil servants. <coughs> but you have to work at it. I certainly became very committed to a view, perhaps it should, I should have realised this earlier, but how important it was to keep relationships going in the good times so that in the bad times you've got a sense of understanding of each other. And actually, I learned that from my social care colleagues. That's where I really learned that. But whatever the reception you get on the other side, <coughs> continuing to work at that relationship, particularly for government and for civil servants, because actually, over a five-year period, priorities inevitably change. They change with the political realities of the day. And actually understanding that is very, very important. What you then do about it, as an independent regulator, you need to take away and think about. I think independent funding is important, so I would certainly argue for that. And in, uh, at the Office of Rail Regulation, we are paid for by the sector. And that was what I was used to in telecommunications as well. We were not paid for by the sector in the Department of Health. We were paid for as an arm's length body by the Department of Health's budget. And that certainly made things more difficult, but it didn't frankly make them fatal. Because at the point at which it was suggested to uh, 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 my chair, Sir Ian Kennedy, that his budget would be rather dramatically cut, he said, hang on a minute, we're not talking about whether the budget should be cut or not, we're talking about what we could do on behalf of patients for different sums of money. And we will then tell you what we think we can do for those different sums of money, and you can in essence choose. And we will then tell patients and the wider uh, community at what level we can come in and carry out this function. Now, I don't quite know whether it was the tone or whether it was, uh, I mean, I thought the points those points made were extremely uh, telling ones. Of course we had some budget cut, and any organisation can take a budget cut at a particular point in time, but we had a realistic discussion about where that funding ended up. Then, finally, I wanted to say, in relation to uh, relation with government and those who set, set uh, uh, up organisations like this, a real plea for stability. I recognise that <laughs> elections take place every five years. But regulation and inspection and, indeed, improvement takes time to bed in. And if you are being told, or your future is being debated, pretty soon after you've been set up, you've got a really difficult challenge. We were told, with no warning, 11 months into our existence, that we were to go. We actually survived another four years. And one of the greatest, actually, uh, I, uh, one of the things I feel proudest about in my career 
is that the staff at the Healthcare Commission remained committed to what they were doing throughout all of that period. But it didn't help us in the job we've got. We, however, were lucky. We took over, as part of the organisation that came into the Healthcare Commission, the National Care Services Commission. It was told after 17 days it was to go. I think that's something which people need to stop and think about. Now, having talked about relations with government, I want to, talk o I want to move on and talk about the behaviour of the organisation, the regulatory body, or whatever it is. A number of points. To understand and focus on your core activities. And it's amazing, actually, how quickly one can get distracted from them. To explain to oneself and to one's wider clientele, both those one regulates and those ones regulating on behalf of, passengers now for me, patients before, what value one's adding. That's incredibly important because it leads the organisation to think, are we actually adding value here? That's quite a difficult question to answer. Activities based on evidence, being absolutely rigorous about using evidence, and in using evidence, trying to get at what Sir Ian used to call the cute questions. Those bits of information which really tell you something. So you don't want to be overloaded with information, but those key bits of information. It was the Healthcare Commission that discovered what was happening at Midstaffs. We should have found out more quickly. <coughs> we found out in the end by the use of disaggregated mortality statistics. I don't know whether actually you realise this because it didn't get a lot of publicity. But the point about the disaggregation of the mortality statistics was that it showed us if you went into Midstaffs with elective surgery, you'd be fine. If you went in anywhere on the emergency care pathway, not just A and E, things were very serious indeed. But it was that disaggregation of statistics that made the difference. And actually, uh, the, uh, another issue which as a regulator is terribly important is thinking through clearly what methodologies one's going to use to get under the skin of what is happening. And actually, my experience both at the Healthcare Commission and actually um, at ORR is you need to use a number of different methodologies. They don't have to be too onerous, but you need to think clearly about how you're trying to get under the skin of these things without putting a burden on those that you're regulating. Fair processes and fair decisions. The processes are enormously important, actually, so people have a chance to comment, object, etc., etc. But they're important for another reason. If an organisation goes down on process, it doesn't matter if it's right in terms of the substance. And what you'll find is somebody who doesn't like a decision on substance will attack you on process if you can. So I spend a lot of my time in the ORR talking about getting our processes right as well as our decisions. And then being endlessly willing to listen, engage and review. The more vociferous critics are, the more important I say it is for us to listen to them. We may not agree with everything, but they may have a kernel of truth. And anyway, if one is to keep a sense of legitimacy in the process going forward, one has to show that one's listened and adapt as appropriate. That legitimacy, by the way, I believe is important, not just in relation to the regulated, but crucially, and this, Nick, I thought was something that didn't perhaps come out of the report, in relation to those on whose behalf regulation is being carried out. Passengers, now for me, patients before. We put a lot of effort into talking to them. You talk about the problems of mission creep, and I think that is a danger for organisations. Concept of Christmas tree quangos, which I thought was a good one. But equally, I think, anybody has to think about if a government comes and says, will you do this? Uh, in our case recently, it's been to do some more things on behalf of passengers, try and sort out ticketing complexity. 
Let's see whether we can avoid railways getting into the uh, 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 problems of the lack of clarity in relation to uh, tic tickets that uh, we've got into with consumers not understanding what they're buying in energy. That's really what we're being asked to do. We do need to take on functions like that thoughtfully and then resource ourselves appropriately for that. Just two final things I wanted to say, going back to this spectrum of standard setting, regulation, inspection and improvement. I've been talking a lot about regulation inspection, so I'm going to leave that. On the standard setting side, I believe strongly that it isn't the role of the regulatory body normally to uh, 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 draw up those standards. It isn't always government. Uh, in healthcare, it's often the professionals, the particular college of uh, uh, doctors. On the other hand, what I would say is, if it's quite clear there's a gap, then I would expect the regulator to move in, as we did with maternity care at the Healthcare Commission, and from time to time we do with safety on the railways. Then my very final point I wanted to make was on improvement. As a regulator, I can't understand not being in the business of improvement as well as minimum standards. I can understand an argument which says that with any sec within any sector, there are a tranche of people, quite large often, who are high performing, and the regulator needs to do less about them. But what I really can't understand is pinning just on... I, I mean, certainly people need to abide by minimum standards, and if they're not, that needs to be laid bare. But I think the duty to encourage improvement, which was what we had at the Healthcare Commission, and what we have over railway safety too, actually is a very important element of getting all of this right, as long as how it's done is open up to discussion and isn't just a regulator's decision. So I hope that's done justice to your very good report and I hope it's exposed from my own experience one or two issues to fuel discussion. Thank you. It's very interesting hearing Anna talking about trains because as she did so our, our panel arrived in, in quick succession. Um, so. Um, let me, um, let me introduce um, Norman Lord Walker, um, obviously a great, Lord Warner, Lord, sorry. <laughs> Lord Warner, sorry, after Anna Walker. Um, let's, um, let's hear from you, and I know we haven't really very, very kindly helped out at the last minute today here really, but had such an excellent speech that I heard a few years ago at the Association of Chief Executives, and was very then followingly, following that very assured by Nick that uh, that are very capable of talking about anything on this topic at any point, at any length in time. So I'm going to give you three minutes now to give your wisdom on this topic. <coughs> Thank you very much for that kind introduction. Um, you're going to hear these... Nick rang me up about 20 past five and said, will I come along and talk about this, since I wasn't sure what this was. Um, this, well, you, what you're going to get is uh, what I thought about between voting unsuccessfully in the division lobby... Um, and arriving here. A couple of anecdotes and a thought for the future. Anecdote number one is around the Audit Commission. I've been involved over uh, my career with really heavily involved in implementing two Audit Commission reports. One on community care by Howard Davis when he was there and uh, another um, in 1996 on reform of youth justice. The latter, the first one, led to all the community care changes really implemented by Ken Clark and Roy Griffiths very successfully, uh, I would say, uh, and actually showed lo local government at its best in actually trying to put together sets of services which kept more people in the community rather than institutional care. The second one was the Audit Commission producing a report on the failures in the youth justice system, which was really leading to uh, kids actually becoming better criminals as they progressed to the existing system. And now both those reports were basically reports about system dysfunction, but they also had a policy overlay. So they were an in external body 
able to analyse why the policy wasn't working as well as the shortcomings in the delivery of services. So point number one is we do need bodies that look at the policy aspects of services, particularly when they need to change. And the NHS is a classic example where there hasn't been the policy overlay to force the change, and I'll talk a bit more about that. What we have got better at is regulating individual providers of services, which is a different issue for actually identifying whether we have the right groups, groupings of service providers. So just park that one for a second. The second one, anecdote, is uh, Warner as Quango colour. And um, in my time as a minister between 2003 and early 2007, uh, my first job I was given by John Reed, bless his cotton socks, was how do we get rid of a large swathe or consolidate he was a bit more brutal than that. Um, the 37 or 38, I can't remember how many arm's length bodies the Department of Health have managed to grow in a period of years. I see Andrew Lanz has <laughs> gone back to uh, the bad old days. He's uh, created a lot more. The real trouble is these bodies tend to grow like topsy. They consume more resources over time. They're rather akin to my other culling activities, which have been intermediate tiers uh, over the, in the public sector over time, who also grow like topsy, topsy and aggregate to themselves new functions and try to convince politicians that civilization would end if any of them disappeared or had their budget in any way curtailed. I'm parodying a bit. I'm not parodying by it very much, I have to tell you. And I think the most tricky thing to do is when you're looking at quangos, separate out, which I did try to do, the regulators from the rest. But we still have ended up, and my reason why, uh, I ought to explain why we fired Anna, um, abolished her body. The real problem was, and we, I have to say that Labour made a real pig's ear of regulation in health and social care. On the other hand, in their defence, there had been no regulation of the NHS for nearly 60 years, um, which had been, we'd regulated the private healthcare sector to death, but actually we had had no systematic regulation of the NHS. Now, Anna and her chairman did a crackingly good job as the Health Care Commission. Where she let me down, and where Ian Kennedy let me down, is that they refused to take over the merged health and social care regulator. So it's all really her fault why we had to actually show her the door. Uh, but what the important thing about what the Health Care Commission did and I think this is now being taken up increasingly by the rebranded, the renewed Care Quality Commission, which looks after health and social care, is that they used, they did daring things. They used data. Um, this was really re revolutionary. The idea that you might use data to identify the greatest areas of risk now, that was a big breakthrough, and I think that breakthrough has continued. My last point is really about the future. What we don't need in the public services, and I'm talking more widely than health and social care, because I've spent uh, my time in home office salt mines, I've spent my time in social security salt mines, I've been in a lot of salt mines over the years. What we don't need is an endless expansion of inspectorates and regulators. That's what we don't need. What we do need, which is the really gap in the system, is the point I was making at the beginning. Who is telling government that, and I'll give you the health and social care, the best way to be actually looking and spending the taxpayer's money on health and care is to have more people cared for in their own home or in the community rather than in acute hospitals with very high overheads. Now, if you say that to the average chief executive of an NHS trust, it is actually rather like swearing in church. And so what we, what we do need are independent bodies, and the Audit Commission were a good example of this, who are able to undertake independent policy activities and actually produce uncomfortable, often, reports for ministers to consider. And it was jolly difficult, I would say, 
from my experience, and I say as someone who was supposed to become the chairman of the Audit Commission until my, until my own party um, deserted me, um, which is a story Nick wrote very well in the FT, uh, what we actually need is people who can do that independent look at whether structures and delivery mechanisms for public services have outlived their usefulness. And we need to move on to a new way of delivering services. And health and social care is a leading contender because it's probably the biggest public spending challenge for whoever's in government after May 2015. Thanks. I, I'm sure you're like me and sitting here and thinking, I wish I could, uh, at one hour's notice, prepare such a good five-minute talk. Um, so, after that, can we please hear from, from you, Margaret, on, on right. particularly the Audit Commission case, but also any wider lessons you've got? Whoops, I don't think. Oh. Uh, I also was voting, and I think I also lost Norman, and, <laughs> and uh, we were voting on whether or not local people should have the right to determine whether or uh, have a say in whether or not they had a local hospital. Uh, which tells you something about regulation, actually. I'll come to it. Can I just... I'm going to make uh, just a few observations. And first of all, well done, Nick. It's a, a really uh, important document. And, you know, congratulations on completing it. And hopefully it'll inform a debate. In the job I've got now as chair of the Public Accounts Committee, one of the huge frustrations is really to see across the piece what I call the vanity of politicians and the effect that has on efficient and effective government. And everybody wants to leave their mark... And too often they feel they should do that by changing a structure and creating a new body rather than focusing on improving the quality of the services. And I agree entirely with what I came in on the end of, tail of what Anna was saying, is what we really want is a bit of stability in structure and a bit of focus actually on what the, what the citizen is experiencing. And as I was thinking about my five minutes today, I was uh, reminded of a report, Alien is here from the National Order of His Office, that we did yesterday, which was a fantastic example of the appalling impact that uh, a politician's vanity has. And Michael Heseltine's here, and he'll remember some of this. This is about all the initiatives in local growth. And they actually go through my political lifetime. They start in the mid-70s when Michael was doing the urban programme. You might remember that. Uh, and we have 38 different structures in that period, since 75, so it's over a 40-year period. I suppose it's a 40-year period. 38 different structures, all designed to stimulate urban regeneration and economic growth in local areas. A complete madness, all with their different acronyms, but all with the same purpose. And all the energy has been focused on establishing the new <coughs> structures, all the money's gone on establishing those structures and far too little uh, energy has gone on actually ensuring that you deliver the uh, changes, particularly in the deprived local community. So for me, dying does not improve, it diverts, if I can use, uh, um, it diverts energies. Um, I was asked to talk about the Audit Commission and uh, probably some, some of what I'm going to say is uh, quite controversial for the National Audit Office as well. But the with the ab abolition of the, na of the Audit Commission, the National Audit Office becomes the only show in town. And I get really concerned about that, and in no way is that a criticism of the fantastic calibre of people that we've got in the National Audit Office and the great job, Andrew, that they do. But I think it's incredibly dangerous to have one organisation being responsible and accountable for following the taxpayer's pound in absolutely every uh, institution that has a, or, or organisation that spends it. The National Audit Office was set up for a different purpose. It doesn't mean it can't evolve, but it was. It was set up as a big department, looking at big departments and big contracts. And what we have now is a completely different landscape of public services, much more fragmented, with a huge, diverse uh, a set of uh, organisations delivering, not only the public sector, but also private and voluntary providers increasingly, now delivering more than half of the goods and services provided from the taxpayer's pound. And it is just scary to think that the only show in town uh, 
protecting the taxpayer and citizen's interest in ensuring effectiveness and efficiency is the National Audit Office. And I would just be absolutely over the moon if somebody would take a serious look to see whether actually all of that is fit for purpose in the new landscape and with the new, uh, new services we've got. Um, I just want to say two, two or three other things. Government is very fond of establishing actually <coughs> independent and improvement agencies. We do it all the time, as we can see there. We then get cross if they criticise us. Uh, and the latest victim of that is Ofsted, um, where um, I think they are doing an excellent job, actually, at again looking at the diversity of providers and beginning to question whether or not they're delivering the policy intent of the government in raising standards and using money effectively. But the moment they start moving away a little bit from uh, uh, um, uh, what government wants to hear from uh, its so-called independent improvement agencies, they, uh, they, uh, government gets concerned. So I think that's my first criticism of government. We, can't, we don't tolerate criticism well. The other thing I do think is actually, um, uh, I do think that we often give our agencies impossible tasks. And I think actually the reorganisation, I probably disagree with you a little bit on that, the reorganisation on health was crazy. We ended up with a CQC when, when you merged so much into it, which was just <coughs> trying at one point to look at dental surgeries and the other point, <coughs> huge district hospitals. And the idea that you could build the capability to inspect both those very diverse um, elements of the health uh, offer in, a, in a, a, a profound and proper way, I think was just asking too much. So the CQC was bound to fail. And I know it's trying hard now and it's better resourced, but I still think that the range of what it's trying to do is probably beyond um, anybody's capability of getting right. So that's my criticism of government. And let me just say something about the agencies, because all too often they are set up for a specific, specific purpose, but they do mushroom and they develop a life on their own and they tend to expand and again it might be the vanity of those who get involved there tend to try and find new areas in which they want to do work and I think that's when they start getting into trouble so that would be my first criticism the second thing is I too often see again in my current job uh, regulators and agencies getting captured by the industry or the or the service that they're supposed to regulate and it's very difficult they're very sort of uh, they're very incestuous internal worlds. I think about defence. I think I'm afraid about transport infrastructure. I think about health. These are all where there are very few people around in that world. People tend to go revolving doors. So you're working for the regulator one day. You're working for the private sector the next. You're working for the government department the third, <coughs> if they pay you enough. But you tend to go round that circle. And I think there's a there's a, t there's a professional capture, which I think is uh, very important. Those, are, those would be my two things. The third thing is just talking about regulation in the future. We have got a very, very fragmented public sector. Um, it is absolutely crucial in that, um, uh, in that uh, environment that we have effective regulators that actually protect the public interest in the delivery of those services. And again, I don't quite agree with Norman that we're good at regulating service providers. Sadly, time and time again at my committee, we see service providers using taxpayers' pound <coughs> providing a lousy service because they're not well regulated. And one thinks again of the voluntary and private providers all too often, um, where, where uh, the lack of quality and the lack of uh, effective services is not picked up by the regulator. But if we're going to have this diverse set of providers operating in the public sphere, then it's hugely important that we have regulators who not only get look, at the, look internally at the professionals, but actually think externally at the public for whom those services are provided. So things like uh, opening, I mean, who thinks of blowing a whistle, go, uh, being a whistleblower to a regulator today? I think probably very few people. And, Changing the culture so that becomes the norm rather than the exception, I think would be uh, very, very important. So I see regulators as being the heart of how we ensure good value and effectiveness in the future, but I see a great need for reform in the way that they're conceived and in the way that they operate if they're to fulfil that role effectively. <coughs> Thank you.
Thank you very much, Margaret. We've got about half an hour for comments and questions, I think. Um, so if uh, we've got some microphones around, I can see a couple of customers there. So we have uh, David Walker, formerly of the Audit Commission, and now at The Guardian, and then uh, uh, Christopher. Um, as you say, Tom, a veteran of the day of infamy that was August the 13th. Um, one might conclude, Nick, from what you said, that if the Audit Commission had spent more on communications, for which I was responsible, it might have had more friends and might have been better able to fend off the depredations of Eric Pickles. But my question is this. That ministers might be whimsical. That ministers might not care about the long-term consequences of their action, let's say, is par for the course. What's interesting about the demise of the Commission, and perhaps the other bodies you look at, certainly in the context of 2010, was the complete absence in one department, CLG, of any pushback. I mean, you, you talk about civil servants not understanding what the business of the commission was, but it goes beyond that, doesn't it? And there is a school of thought, certainly evinced by some former civil servants, that the enthusiasm of the civil service with a new government to prove it was on side meant, in the case of CLG, nobody was prepared to say to Eric Pickles and his special advisers, you are making, even in your own terms, a set of profound errors. I see Michael is behind us, and I must thank him for making me uh, the first uh, member of the first audit commission. Um, I'd like to say something quickly about that, and something quickly about now as well. It was a very difficult task. As I recall it, uh, we got a lot of um, accountants of sorts from all over local authorities, or dealing with local authorities. Uh, their idea of audit had no relation whatever to what a private audit or even a, a, a treasury order would regard as that. They were interested in propriety. And we had a chief executive, as I recall, who made great speeches. But it wasn't quite clear how we were going to make progress. And I think one of the tributes to uh, our successors is that they did find a function out of what was a very, very difficult. Uh, value for money, well that, you know, was, yes, that was something one should go for. But what was the value that one was looking for from all the uh, various local authority functions? There's still, I think, a huge job to be done in trying to work out w w what are the benefits to which one attributes the cost. <coughs> in those days, certainly cost control was very difficult indeed for all sorts of reasons, and certainly the audit commission initially had a tremendously difficult time about that. And I could go on for this for quite, really quite a long time, but I won't try. But coming up to date, um, I would like to agree with Margaret absolutely about uh, you know, the need to clarify the relationship between uh, the Audit Commission or its successor and the NAO. My own view is that there's a lot to be said for having two NAOs. There's something about competition between the functions of auditors within the public sector, which is at least as important as in the private <laughs> sector. But I won't dwell on that. I think the, the real issue here is one where I find myself disagreeing with Anna Walker. Um, it is very difficult indeed if they, in a sense, suggest policies, auditors suggest policies. They may point out inadequacies or mistakes with existing <coughs> policies, but the job of an auditor should be to assess value for money or assess uh, the working of existing organizations. If it gets mixed up in policy making, that leads to all sorts of troubles and conflict with ministers. And uh, that should be avoided. Regu our regulatory system is so far away from Hayek, the belief that regulation should be economically straightforward. Uh, it really is, and the ministers do change the regulatory instructions very frequently, and that, I think, gives a lot of difficulty to auditors. Uh, the last point I'd make Mr. is, I think, Sorry, I'm gonna, I'm gonna and that is for the very last very point. Very last point. <laughs> I'll keep, is that uh, I don't think the Audit Commission <coughs> should always have reported to ministers. I believe it should report it to Parliament. The accountability that really matters most in these cases is an accountability to Parliament. 
Very good point. Any more, uh, more comments from the floor first, and then I think we'll come back to the panel once we've had a bit more discussion. Right if you can just say your name <coughs> and where you come from. I know your uh, history as well, but go ahead. Sorry? I know you're, you're involved as well, in, in, I am, implicated um, in some capacity too. I am. I'm Jeremy Newman. I'm the current chair of the Audit Commission, um, appointed in 2012 uh, to oversee its closure. Um, and therefore, such criticisms as there are of chairman or the boards of the Audit Commission are, are, are before my time. Um, <laughs> but, but, but I would make one other observation, if I can, because y you've quite rightly pointed out two of the issues that will arise from the demise of the Commission. And first of all, the lack of any independent appointment of auditors. Um, and second, clearly, the lack of comparable information that will be available. Um, but there will, I believe, be a third loss from the demise of the Audit Commission, um, which is the value that the Commission has managed to get out on, on, on audit fees uh, through the benefits of its central procurement. Um, as, as you will be aware, uh, following the announcement of its closure, the 70% of audit work that was handled in-house was put out to the private sector, um, and audit fees have reduced for local authorities by something in the region of 40%. Uh, we have recently decided to put out to tender the remaining 30% that was already out in the private sector um, and the board will be making a decision later this month on the allocation of those contracts um, but I'm reasonably confident uh, that we will see yet further reductions I I in audit fees um, and in an environment of austerity that we are in at the moment um, anything that can drive down audit fees by that sort of percentage it seems to me is something to be welcomed um, as soon as you take that away uh, um, and my history before I was at the Audit Commission was running one of the private sector audit firms. It doesn't take a genius to work out what's going to happen to fees and how much local authorities are going to end up paying uh, for the benefit of their audit. I've got a question back to you quickly, slightly provocative one, which is, do you think there's any possibility that the Audit Commission in some form will be reinvented? Uh, that's not a question. You'll have to ask the politicians yeah. that yeah. one. Indeed. <laughs> there you go. The answer is yes. <laughs> Very good. Jill. Hi, I'm Jill Rutter, I'm from the Institute for Government. Um, I just want to ask really um, both Margaret Hodge and uh, Lord Warner, get the name right, uh, a question about, we. you say that actually there's this sort of massive instability, so people are always changing structures. I just wondered on the government side, what could we do to actually disincentivize the easiest thing is always just to change a structure, that's the way of getting my imprint on it, whatever. I mean, how do we sort of rebalance the system back to make that a bit harder? And I want to ask Lord Warner, you mentioned the tendency of these bodies to aggregate functions, grow like topsy and stuff like that. Um, did you, when you were looking at the department, rather than just sort of say, well, they've got to have a sort of periodic cull, that's the only way of dealing with them, a bit like badgers, stuff like that, before they move the goalposts, I mean, do you see any sort of changes to the governance of the way the department relates to the bodies, which might actually stop that happening? So there's an alternative to, you know, the cycle of, you know, establish, get out of control, cull, establish, etc. I think two excellent questions there, which we, I think the whole panel could probably probably deal with. Would you like to have a go first? Uh, how do you stop change? How do you uh, stop? How do we make it, how do we make it uh, the not the first option <coughs> to restructure or create new bodies? <laughs> it's an impossible question. Um, uh, I, I mean, I, I can't think. I think probably, um, I think greater stability, the one thing that this government has done is kept ministers there for longer. So I think it's a good thing because there's less feeling that you're in for a year, you've got to change something in that year to, to, to leave your mark. That's probably a good thing. So stability of uh, ministerial appointments might be one idea. Um, uh, I, I don't know. It's a really hard question, it's because what you're asking for there is trying to get a much more consensual cross-party uh, agreement around a whole er, uh, set of areas of policy which... Uh, would make for greater stability and therefore longer term improvement and commitment. And that's hard to get to. I think it's something we all aspire to. There's a real, I mean, let me just give it a, a positive. There is a real move at the moment to try and get the issue about civil service reform um, uh, <coughs> into, a, into a place where there is actually cross party support for uh, working together and therefore not changing direction at every, uh, at every election. If that works and there's quite a lot of uh, uh, push behind it, that might 
begin to be the model. And it, uh, my third talk, probably, just thinking about it, is actually if Parliament had a stronger role in the new way that Parliament is establishing its credibility and force, it may be that through Parliament one can get greater buy-in across parties to uh, structures uh, and uh, therefore less of a feel that the only way that you could change the world is by changing a structure. Does anyone else have any answers to alternatives to culls? Well, I mean, I think culls are a feature of the past because of the way many of these bodies were actually set up. They were, they were ill-conceived in many cases. Certainly some of the ones I inherited were, uh, I mean, the 2002 NHS reorganisation was a disaster waiting to happen with the number of new bodies it created. The thing which is actually improving is pre- and post-legislative scrutiny by Parliament. And I'm, in, I'm, I'm on my second <laughs> pre-legislative scrutiny. Of one, of the one I'm on at the moment is the, mo modern, the draft Modern Slavery Bill. But I was on a joint select committee on um, the Care Bill. Now, what is, most of these bodies have been set up under some primary legislation. And I think what pre-legislative scrutiny does and does at least in a rather elegant way with cross-party membership and in joint committees, Lords and Commons, it does actually give the government time to have another think a bit about some of the details. And certainly the government has thought again about some of the aspects of the Care Bill, and I have every reason to think that Theresa May will think again about some of the aspects of the Modern Slavery Bill. And I think that is a way of at least nudging people towards some kind of cross-party consensus. It's not perfect, but it's better than it was before, where a government with a big majority would just ram through Parliament the establishment of new, of new bodies. Um, I have to just say on that, we have pre-legislative scrutiny of the uh, <coughs> a bill to abolish the Audit Commission. And I tried really hard to stay away from the politics and just have little pragmatic ideas which might have made the world a little bit more sensible and every single notion was rejected. So I think there has to be a willingness on part of the ministers to think a little bit outside the closed political box and listen to some common sense that sometimes comes out of it. And you might have it on yours, I didn't have it on mine. Well, you're, you're, you're right, Margaret, but before you knock my idea, you've got to come up with a better one. Okay. <laughs> Anna. Well, I wonder whether some of the language of this needs changing, because you can say that this organisation or that organisation has been culled, but going back to a point that uh, you were making, Margaret, about how important it is to think about what was the purpose of the setting up of this organisation. And if you think about organisations such as Ofcom that were formed out of uh, different elements of the telecommunications <coughs> and broadcasting uh, market, or of GEM, uh, electricity and gas being brought together, fundamentally a view was taken that those organisations had served a purpose, but things had moved on and creating a new body which could look at the new issues was better. And I think if we were more open that actually, this is arguing in a sense against stability, I think you can still have stability, but if you can recognise that any organisation is going to have a limited life, and what you need is an open debate when the public service needs it to move on. Very good. Yeah, Very quickly. The other um, David's question about no pushback from DCLG, and um, I mean, that's kind of a broader question, isn't it, about, about the, nature, the reaction of the civil service to incoming governments. And, you know, there, there are, well, I'm not sure I entirely share this view, but, you know, there are people who would say the Department of Health didn't push back hard enough against Lansley on, on, when, on what he wanted to do. Uh, and there's kind of a, you know, there is a real problem when you have a new minister with a mandate who's determined to do something about how far the civil service can say, well, you can't do that, because in the end they have to do what the elected government of the day does, if they have a very determined minister, they're very hard to stop. I mean, one of the intriguing things about the Audit Commission, though, is, is because Eric Pickering did it in August, uh, if you look at the Treasury pushback, you'd expected much more pushback from the Treasury <coughs> than worried about value for money. And though the documents are available redacted, it didn't push very hard. And you know, one reason was, it was you know, its main business at that point was slashing public sector spending. It was busy doing something else. 
And you know, Health had an interest in the Audit Commission, uh, and you know, I was talking to a senior finance guy at Health only last night who said, we're still trying to work out what the hell's going to happen when the Audit Commission finally goes. You know, we're not very happy. But they were being done over by Lansley trying to reform the whole of the NHS, and there was a sort of diversion of attention problem when abolition of the Audit Commission came along on, on behalf of those two departments. DCLG, I don't know. Um, the point about reporting to Parliament, I think, is a really neat one. And I actually think if the Audit Commission ever got recreated in some way, if it reported to Parliament, that would actually be rather a really good thing, much like the NAO does. Because, A, that would help, you know, kind of that would help with stability, because it would require MPs to decide they wanted to get rid of it, not some minister suddenly deciding on a whim they wanted to. Uh, and the point about central procurement for audit, I entirely agree. I mean, it's in the report. I just didn't want to go on too long at the beginning. But, I mean, central procurement is just blindingly obvious, isn't it? And isn't one of the ironies that Francis Moore is going around centrally procuring all sorts of things. So that makes a lot of sense while blowing it up for the local for council audit. I mean, it just doesn't add up. Got a few more people who want to ask questions. So there's, uh, I'll come down to the front here first and then uh, at the back and then to Steve. So we'll do three more com comments or questions. And if you could again say where you're from as well. I'm um, David Heald, University of Aberdeen. I've got two questions directly to Margaret Hodge. Uh, does the Public Accounts Committee still believe in the Sharman principle that public sector bodies shouldn't appoint their own auditors? That was a principle very much fought for by two of your illustrious predecessors, Robert Sheldon and David Davis. And the second point, the second point is we've heard already this evening about contracted out audit costing less, but are you concerned about the narrowing of the scope of what public audit involves? Yeah. Two very good questions there. Oh. Uh, hi, uh, Dennis Skinner, Local Government Association, and I work on the, uh, the improvement part of the LGA. Um, the problem with, uh, with death um, is everyone starts coming out and talking very favourably uh, about them. Um, now, I, I wouldn't want to speak ill of the dead and all the dying, um, but neither should we allow to enter into folklore things that aren't true. And um, I'm a great believer the Audit Commission has done a lot of really valuable work and uh, will do so over the next few months. Um, and it did a lot of work about helping councils to improve. But it wasn't primarily an improvement agency. The Audit Commission was a provider of audit services. Um, major part of that was its in-house service, and it's a very successful and very good service, and it was a provider of inspectorate and uh, inspection, and I think there is a big difference between inspection and improvement. Uh, in my view, improvement only really happens um, if it's owned locally. Uh, it can't be done to local public bodies, uh, and improvement support needs to be based on that principle, and that's why at the LGA, uh, that is our mantra, and actually during the CPA days, um, independent evaluation showed that those councils who had one of the IDA, LGA corporate peer challenges or who uh, invested in some of our political leadership academy programs improved by more than 80% more than those th authorities that didn't uh, if you follow the CPA rating. So um, I'd like to say that improvement is alive and well and kicking uh, amongst the sector. In the last two and a half years we've delivered over 300 peer challenges to councils making use of peers from the sector, members and officers, uh, nearly a thousand of them, providing their own time and their own support to give something back to the sector, but also learn something from all the councils up and down the country. Because in every council, uh, there are good things that are happening which the sector can learn from. Very good. And Steve. I was the Audit Commission's Chief Executive until March 2010. Now, I want to make a couple of points about, the, um, about mission creep and about the um, uh, governments, the, the assumption that some speakers have had that kind of governments love to create new public bodies all the time. Because I don't think either of those are, uh, are quite true. Um, actually, the, um, uh, in the case of the uh, Audit Commission, uh, mission creep was always highly controversial uh, within the Commission. When I became um, its chief executive, after it had taken on uh, the inspection function, I inherited an organization where taking on that function had been hugely divisive within the organization. It had created schism in the management team, and there were two cultures. There was an audit culture and an inspection culture, and the auditors, who represented 80% of the staff, felt that inspection was the tail that was wagging the dog, and they were absolutely um, opposed to 
uh, taking on that function. They didn't want that um, uh, mission creep. And it follows on from, from, um, from Dennis's point that actually there is a huge difference between audit inspection and, and the functions of an improvement agency. And those functions kind of never rested um, entirely easily within the commission, even r right to the end. But the, yeah, but the commission didn't perhaps resist um, taking um, on some of the additional functions it had, uh, it was given over the years, in the way in which it should have done. And there's a kind of good reason for that, because <coughs> contrary to what's been said, when a government wants to create an entirely new function, like the inspection of local government, a new government function, or indeed the inspection of uh, GP services, it's always easier to give that function to an existing respected body than to create a new public body um, to take it on. Creating new public bodies is actually quite difficult. All governments come into office promising to have a bonfire of quangos. They create new quangos as they mature, but they all come into office prom promising to have a bonfire um, of quangos. And so, uh, and for the, for the public body concerned, it's kind of, you know, the, uh, the, the, the suggestion from your sponsoring department that you'll be given some uh, additional function is seen as a vote of confidence. Some public bodies, therefore, don't resist some of these um, uh, extensions of remit in the way that they should. But I think it's a mistake to believe that public bodies um, are in favor of mission creep or that ministers always want to create new organizations. Actually, ministers mostly want to create new government functions, and they will very often prefer to give those government functions to an existing body, because it's much easier to do that than to create a new one. Very interesting point. Um, so three things there, all around the Audit Commission, really. Does, I mean, obviously, some of those questions, Margaret, were directly for you. So if you want to answer first on on the first two questions about whether you believe it, does the NAO still believe in the principle of independent audit? And um, uh, the second one was, sorry, um, so concerned about scope creep. Yeah. Um, I, I can't speak for the NAO, I can speak for the PAC. Yeah. Uh, the PAC, I think we, we do feel it's really important that you have independence. Uh, you know, I go with you on both those things, David, but there shouldn't, uh, should be independence of audit appointment. And it's not just uh, local government we're talking about here. It is all the health trusts, all the academy trusts. Um, it's, the, it's the growing range of public bodies using pub, uh, taxpayers' money. And I also agree with you about the scope of national public audit ought to be wider. Uh, and I think that is, a, that is a real, actually, difference in that the government does believe these can be like private sector bodies and therefore should be ordered in that way. And I just think that's wrong. And anyone else on the panel want to come back on any of the other points? I want to challenge Steve, really. I mean, I think it depends where you look. If you look in health, you have to, and I, I, um, this is not a party political point, if you look at both the Labour government and the coalition government, the number of new bodies they both created, it runs into the hundreds. It doesn't actually, it's not one or two here or there. I mean, these are big numbers of new bodies. And they tend not to share back office services. They tend to want to have their own finance director. They tend to want to have their own human resources director and blah, 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 blah. So in the, in the field of health, I would say the, the mindset until very, very recently has been we will improve these services by organisational change. We've got this elixir of youth somewhere in our mandate, which will actually mean that we can provide these enormous new bodies who will somehow magically change the world. And most of these reorganisations at current prices cost something of the order of £3 billion a time to do it. So you've got a mindset in the political elected, I'm being going to be very careful, the elected political class, where um, there, is, there is a reach... <laughs> There is a reach for the organisational change levers, certainly in health. And, and, and that's that, I don't know enough about some of the other sectors, but unless that kind of changes, um, you're, you're desti the regulators then have an impossible job. The improvers and regulators have an impossible job because they're endlessly um, inspecting and visiting people who've been in the job three weeks. Um, very interesting. 
There's gonna be, I'm going to have time for one more, <coughs> probably, one more comment, and then I'm going to ask the uh, panel for concluding remarks on anything, I think, particularly forward-looking that they'd like to see change over the next few years, and particularly thinking into 2015 and beyond. Thank you. Uh, Hugh Lloyd, uh, the Labour Party has said that if it uh, becomes a majority government, it will abolish Ofgem. Uh, Ofgem is perhaps more a regulator than an improvement agency, although perhaps it could improve the performance of the big six. What would your recommendations be for that process? And I've heard two or three, so each of the panel might have a view on how that change should take place. Very interesting. <coughs> and then, uh, we just take one more at the front, actually. Uh, Rich Johnson from Public Finance Magazine. Just to ask, the um, report touches on the potential effectiveness of the bits of the Audit Commission that will continue elsewhere, the Value for Money Studies by the National Audit Office, the Fraud Initiative in the Cabinet Office. Um, in, in previous um, abolitions, is there evidence that that effectiveness will suffer when, when they're moved around? Um, is that something that is a fear that these initiatives, while continuing in name, might not work as well when they get rehoused? Very good. Um, so if you want to wrap the answers to those questions into your final comments, I set you a challenge. Um, that would be absolutely great because everyone's dying for a drink, I think. Um, so let's, uh, let's run down the panel, starting with... Actually, let's, let's give Nick the last word and we'll start with Margaret. Hi. Um, fortunately, I'm somewhat rem uh, uh, remote from the, uh, the Labour leadership in my current role, which is a lovely place to be. But uh, <laughs> um, uh, I, I do think Ofgem is one of the uh, regulators, which I think... Uh, the feeling I get from the work we've done in PAC, I'm afraid to say, is that it has been captured by the industry. Now, whether it can uh, perform reform itself to really protect the public interest, uh, we've seen it both in the sort of uh, uh, infrastructure investment um, uh, plans, uh, I, is where I've witnessed it in particular recently, uh, and we've seen it a little bit in uh, um, in the way some of the some of the uh, letting of contracts, um, you know, the privatisation of the infrastructure to uh, bring energy from offshore into the, into the grid, for example, was a classic <coughs> example of something which was really not in the public interest. It's costing us all as consumers much more than we ought. And there was nobody in the system who was really regulating that in the public interest. So I think it needs at the very, you know, whether you need to set up a new institution, I wouldn't. But it needs a radical rethink of how it's structured. Can I just finally say something, probably didn't say enough about the Audit Commission, which is clearly looking at the audience as where most people are from. Um, I, I think we're get, we are going to have a real go. Let me just say this, working with the NAO, because that's the structure we've got, working with the NAO, through the PAC, to try and ensure that we maintain uh, <coughs> vigilance over uh, value for money provided through local authority services. A lot of money, public taxpayers' money, public money, goes through that, uh, goes through local government. And it, it's our job to do that. Now, uh, we are only resourced, and this might be a force for good, we're only resourced to look at about eight areas in any one year, once the Audit Commission goes which is much less than the Audit Commission does. And I think, Steve, there was creep there. I think there was creep there in that there were, one of the things that got on people's wires was that they did just too many reports and too many inquiries, and it was felt to be in too intrusive. Now, I think the, the pendulum's probably swung back wrongly in the other direction in that we will be limited in, 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 in what we can do. And we're also <coughs> limited in that it's quite clear in the legislation that we can't haul in front of us um, individual local authorities, uh, whereas we can actually haul in front of us individual health trusts, because that's uh, how it's been constitutionally set up, and uh, we can't do it. It's a mad thing to do, I agree with that, but it's, it's how constitutionally there. We can't with local authorities. So our ability to really provide intelligent analysis of where authorities spend money effectively and efficiently uh, and to provide some sort of a barometer 
of where <coughs> there is a need for improvement, as to where there is uh, a need for um, uh, people to, f uh, to, to, to learn from, uh, from, from good practice, our ability to do that is going to be constrained. And I think that will be a loss. And something will happen. It will be a Doncaster or a Westminster in the future, which I think will put the sh fear of God into whoever at that point is, has got ministerial responsibility in the um, uh, Department for Local Government, which will lead to the recreation of some body which will provide uh, a better independent oversight over whether or not there is effectiveness and value for money. So I see it coming back <coughs> in some form, probably within a decade. That would be my prediction. That's interesting. Anna? I think one of the things I've been really struck by is uh, uh, the point that Norman made earlier on about uh, regulatory bodies potentially being good at looking at uh, individual provider, the assessment of individual <coughs> providers but often the issue that lies under some of that performance are much wider policy issues and the need to grasp those. Now, just in, in, in response to, to your point, I, I, I was not saying that I thought that regulators ought to become involved in those policy issues, because I don't. I think that they are <coughs> for government. But I think that what a regulator can do, and certainly we have tried to do on railways, is sometimes <coughs> to point out whether is in fact a wider issue that needs to be grasped. Not for us to do, but sometimes we can see it very clearly. But I think grasping that wider issue can often be the solution to a lot of the issues. And clearly, coming out of this evening is this feeling that the abolition of the Audit Commission does leave a gap there, which is a serious wider policy issue. Law and order. Well, I'm certainly not close to the inner councils of the Labour Party, so who knows what they're, <laughs> they're up to. Um, what I would say is I think the big challenge, because of the fiscal constraints for the next Parliament, is going to be about securing value for money. And that is blending quality with what you spend. Now, if the Audit Commission is not there and all we've got is Margaret and the NAO, that's a big ask for them to sort of crack all that lot in, 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 on, on their own. And I think you're going to find people <laughs> filling the void. And the people who are going to fill the void, I think, will be the think tanks. And the think tanks are in pretty rude health, I would say. I just want to talk about one regulator because he's in the audience. The elected political class have found the whole business of reconfiguring hospitals too difficult. So they've kind of subcontracted this in a rather elaborate way to the luckless David Bennett of Monitor, who has responsibility for the failure regime. I mean, he has to do with the failing organisation and secure continuity of services. Now, if that is an abrogation of political responsibility, I'm struggling to find one that equally matches it. But good luck, David. <laughs> <laughs> and right. final word. Well, I, uh, my, my simple really, I'd like to see a phoenix. Uh, I mean, I do think independent audit is a really important issue, and out of the whatever interim body finally takes over the Audit Commission, Maybe the incoming government can recreate a commission for local audit uh, or some such, some such body. And I, and I would really make the point, this is absolutely not a political issue. Uh, I mean, whatever incoming government it is, after all, it was a Conservative government that founded the Audit Commission. So if the Conservatives win, they can have second thoughts. And if Labour win, they can have second thoughts for them. You know, I mean, whatever happens, someone will have to go there. Thank you very much, Nick. Um, so thank you very much for coming to us today. Very broad-ranging discussion. The most important discussion is the one over drinks outside that follows this. But can you quickly thank our panel before we move on? Thank you.